Hey everyone, welcome to another Hardware News Recap. This one, the first video that we filmed in our new space. The first non-moving vlog video. For this week's Hardware News, we have Lenovo listing the 2000 series R3 and R5 CPUs. A GV104 GPU listed on 864 for one of their updates. And TSMC's fabrication plants being hit with a PC virus that actually impacted production. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake's View 37 case. The View 37 focuses on highlighting custom PC builds with its full panoramic window and tinted front acrylic. In our thermal testing, the View 37 performed reasonably well when considering its looks-focused build, which is partly thanks to the airflow design and the removal of a bottom power supply shroud. For a balance of looks and performance, check the link in the description below for the View 37. So first bit of news is us. We are now in the new studio. We have a whole moving vlog series. It's still going on as we continue to add to the space and improve upon it. And this is the first video we're shooting here. We have a lot of work to do. This was built like fewer than 24 hours ago, the wall behind me. And uh, we'll be talking about it more in the moving vlog series if you're curious. But otherwise, uh, there are other things to talk about for this week like our products. So we've restocked all the stuff on the store. The glasses come in very soon if you've been interested in those. Otherwise, the mod mats and the posters are all there. If you're interested, store.gamersnexus.net for those. First news item. So Ada64, the very popular monitoring and stress testing software, has listed an NVIDIA GV104 as the GTX 1180. The naming of NVIDIA's new GPUs have been up for major debate. It's not really clear whether it's 1100 or 2000 series. Also doesn't really matter, but either way, GV is the demarcation for Volta. And if this listing is to be believed as legitimate and not just because they were testing something, then Final Wire's release of the new beta version of Ada64 indicates support for a few new NVIDIA GPUs. And those include GV102, GV102GL, GV104, and GV104M. Additionally, looking at device IDs, the device ID 1E87 lists the GV104 as the rumored GTX 1180. As for how consequential this is, not really. We know that there are going to be new GPUs, and the name doesn't really matter a whole lot at this time. None of this shows us anything about the specs. We don't know the performance. There are no leaked benchmarks other than what's already been out there. So this is not new in that regard at all. It's just naming and the literal GPU ID, GV104, or whatever it may be. So if that holds, then I guess we have some ideas and possible names. But otherwise, that's really all it is right now. Lenovo has revealed their R3 and R5 series CPU containing devices, desktops, laptops, so forth. And the new ones are the 2000 series. So 2000 series came out several months ago at this point, but we never got the R3 and the R5 was kind of limited. So their new reveals, whether intentional or not, show specifications for AMD's unreleased R3 2300X and their R5 2500X in new documents for their ThinkCenter M725 SFF platform, or small form factor platform. These new CPUs are successors to the R3 1300X, for example, and the R5 1500X, which we were never particularly fond of, given the alternative 1600, which was significantly better and not that much more money. But these are based on AMD's 12 nanometer Zen Plus configuration, so they should bring all the same improvements that AMD has brought forward for Ryzen 2000 series. That would include things like better power management, lower latencies in some areas, and also significantly better uh, memory configurations on motherboards. A lot of that is platform side, where BIOS and firmware have improved significantly since the initial launch. So that's what we know from them. It's looking like R3 2300X and R5 2500X not too far out at this point, given Lenovo's accidental leaks, or potentially accidental. Looking at the specs, though, from Lenovo, base frequency is up about 100 megahertz, with boost frequencies up a notable 300 megahertz. DRAM support is also increased to DDR4-2933, the same we saw with Threader for 2. Makes sense. Same move to Zen Plus. And uh, it's up from DDR4-2667 officially. So you can clock higher than that. It's just that the official JEDEC support is now 2933. So that's a good move for AMD's upcoming processors. TSMC's fabrication plant was hit with a virus. This is actually pretty significant news. And it's interesting at that. Digitimes reported that the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing com Company halted production to clear manufacturing systems of a WannaCry variant of 
the virus that went around a while ago now. The impact of production will set TSMC back about 2% in quarterly revenue. And if 2% doesn't sound high, keep in mind that the amount of volume they do means that 2% of its quarterly revenue equates about $170 million in downtime as a result of this WannaCry variant that affected their fabrication, uh, their systems attached to fabrication machines and fabrication technology. So big hit there for TSMC from something that is kind of unexpected for a fab plant. AMD announcing second gen third for we had a whole video on this. You probably already know most of the specs. If you haven't seen it, check it out. We had a topological diagram showing the die configuration where the interconnects are, which dies are active for threader for two, for the uh, higher core count, 32 core CPU, and for the lower core count ones as well. But just to catch everyone up, the availability and prices were announced this week. Threader for two is based on 12 nanometers N plus as well, just like the R3 was for 2000 series. And it brings the same improvements for the most part that we saw with other 2000 series chips. Won't go over those again, but one of them is a better volt frequency curve where you can sustain in significant ways the same given frequency at a lower voltage than you could with Ryzen 1000 or Threader for 1000. This is much needed because Threader for 2 being higher core count will be higher power consumption. And so having that improved volt frequency curve where you can drop the voltage for a higher frequency than previously will enable them to make some trade-offs without actually really losing much. So that's, uh, that's kind of a recap of what we already talked about with our Threader for 2 news post. Also, Jet Speeds 2933, Precision Boost 2, and XFR2 also available. So for more information for topology, prices, launch dates, see our article below or the previous video. Samsung's consumer QLC SSD is next in the news. We talk about SSD technology every now and then. Samsung's been producing their first consumer-oriented 4TB QLC SATA-based SSD. QLC has been the preeminent topic in NAND news lately with Micron, Intel WD, and Toshiba all announcing their own QLC NAND or QLC products. Samsung's QLC SSD will use 64 layer one terabyte NAND with alleged performance similar to that of their TLC NAND, somewhat significant here. To begin, Samsung will offer one terabyte, two terabyte, and four terabyte options of, this, of these uh, SSDs based on this technology, and M2 drives are slated for a later date, if interested in those. QLC NAND is promising to bring Lower prices per gigabyte over TLC and MLC. This is kind of just how it works. You're looking at voltage states per cell, basically. And we have a video on how NAND works. If you're curious what all of these acronyms mean, search the channel for how NAND works, and you should find it. But more or less, when you expand the uh, amount of voltage states you have in a given cell, there is a potential endurance hit, but it's at the increase of gigabytes per dollar, so to speak. So you're paying less money because you can fit more in a given area than you could with something like MLC or especially SLC, but the endurance goes down as a result because you're painting that, uh, that sector more, or I should say that cell more when looking for your data. So QLC NAND is promising those lower prices for uh, price per gigabyte layout, and they are aiming to bring down the cost of terabyte SSDs pushing hard drives further out of the client storage space. Next up, PC hardware and many materials relating to the manufacturing of semiconductors or semiconductor equipment is set to raise in cost as much as 25% by the end of August. The current administration of the US is set to levy new tariffs, totaling $16 billion worth of imports going into effect by August 23rd. This marks the second time the U.S. has ignored warnings from the likes of the House of Representatives and the Semiconductor Industry Association unilaterally slapping tariffs against China and further escalating the U.S.-China trade war. If you're interested in this, it's looking like it will actually, if this all goes through, impact the price of PC components. Origin PC has spoken about this. They're an SI based in the U.S. and have noted that they have concerns about increasing prices as a result of the tariffs. We have in our show notes linked below a link to the, uh, all the products affected by the new tariffs if you're interested or curious about what specifically might have price changes for us as consumers. And then another item here, this one, pretty interesting, NZXT pushing its game-themed custom cases. They did this with PUBG recently and had a new PUBG case. We can show that on the screen at some point. So the PUBG case was the start of NZXT's push to custom paint existing lines, like the H700. In this case, there's a new Nuka-Cola themed case and also motherboards themed Nuka-Cola after the Fallout series, which is 
timed very suspiciously for the new Fallout game being recently discussed. And this has a motherboard with matching theme as well available separately. The case is extra, it's 300 bucks, so it's quite a bit over the stock H700, but it does have a limited quantity custom paint theme if you're really into Fallout. The motherboard covers are available for an extra $50, but are only compatible with the NZXT N7 motherboard. So this isn't functional, it's not really a new product, but we found the effort to make cases actually customized in a different way for once worth talking about. And hopefully this is something that uh, can be managed in terms of price and they can expand their licensing capabilities for popular games. The Flash Memory Summit took place this past week and there were, of course, many announcements emanated from the event. We'll mention a couple of the more notable ones that'll be more likely to infiltrate the market and not be limited to just data centers or enterprise. Toshiba's 3D XL Flash is one example of those newer technologies. Toshiba announced their 3D XL Flash in what appears to be a response to Intel's Optane 3D Crosspoint and Samsung's Xenand. Toshiba's 3D XL Flash uses Toshiba's existing SLC Flash and uses shorter bit lines and word lines. And Toshiba's new Flash is aimed at high performance and low latency at the expense of capacity. As such, Toshiba intends to use Flash as a high performing caching option alongside its forthcoming QLC products and potentially replacing DRAM on hard drives. SK Hynix had an announcement as well with 4D NAND. SK Hynix have named their new Flash technology as 4D NAND, which is a, a bit misleading. Hynix isn't adding a fourth dimension to their NAND chips, but is instead using a combination of CTF and Puck. No, not that one, not the NZXT puck. These are the charge trap flash and periphery under cell. To reduce die size, CTF and puck can be combined, which also increases density and reduces cost while maintaining competitiveness. SK Hynix intends to sample the first gen 40 NAND in Q4 2018 in the form of 96 layer TLC one terabit dies. Additionally, SK Hynix is readying their 4D NAND for QLC as well, slated for 2019. Finally, for hardware sales for the week, we saw EVGA's GTX 1080 FTW2, at time of writing, available for about 430 bucks. We've also regularly been seeing 1080s hit sale prices of 470 to 480, which is a bit lower than they were supposed to be several months ago. This is obviously before what many are suggesting at this point could be a GPU launch. So based on all of the rumor articles we've seen, it makes sense that these, the GPU prices are finally dropping back to roughly where they should have been for a year now. Corsair's K70 Lux RGB is also on sale for about 110 bucks. Amazon's list price, often not fully accurate to reality at 160, so that's potentially dropped if you're interested in that one. Corsair has a VS550, and this is a 550 watt power supply. At time of writing and filming, it's available for about $20 post rebate. If you're into rebates, not the best, but for budget builders, you could do worse for $20, certainly. And finally, Trident Z's RGB 16 gigabyte 3600 megahertz memory, given the ongoing market for DRAM and the climate of DRAM, isn't a terrible deal either. It's still wildly overpriced, just less so than usually. This kit's been selling for around 230, but it's currently 185. So that's it for this week. As always, links in the description below for the show notes, for the hardware sales, for the GN store. And you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up the mod mat or our video card teardown poster, the anatomy poster that I have behind me. And for more, subscribe as always. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.